Welcome back. This is Jennifer Richmond, and this is the Dwelling Richly Bible Study, and we are beginning a new book. Today, this is the beginning of Second Peter. So th thank you for being with us. I hope you've uh, been with us for the previous study through First Peter. That was a great one, and uh, so much to learn. I feel like we could have just parked it there for a month, right? Well, we're going to go through Second uh, Peter for the next several days and enjoy an overview of that book. So if you haven't already don't, uh, downloaded the, the Bible study, go to La Mirada Christian Church's website, go to the Women's Ministry page, and you'll see Bible study there. Scroll through that and then download that, and uh, you can you can join us with, in the Bible study that way. You can also just come by church and pick up an actual hard copy of this hard copy of the study. But either way, we're glad um, that you're with us wherever you're listening from, watching from, and uh, say hi. Let us know that you're here. I'm uh, happy to happy to connect with you. We love our community here. Well, let me go ahead and get us started. I'm going to read the introduction to the study, and then we're going to dive right in to Second Peter. All right. So, <coughs> excuse me. This study is designed to offer time in the Word for the purpose of understanding better who God is and in so doing, knowing ourselves and our purpose better. This is a simple, light study to give you an overview of scripture and an exposure to thinking biblically and studying exegetically. We'll read, think, pray, write, consider, and apply the truths and concepts we find in the Word of God. Use any version of the Bible that you're comfortable with. I recommend the English Standard Version or ESV Bible. You can uh, use your smartphone app, but getting the Bible into your hands will elevate your experience. So I strongly advise that you use a good old-fashioned Bible. Be willing to write and highlight and take notes in your Bible. I mark mine up all the time. It helps me remember things better, right? Set aside time every day and grow in the discipline of actual study. Join me, the online Bible study community, or study on your own. Um, amazing rewards await for those who take time to read and study God's word. And those of you who've entered into that and have enjoyed studying, you see that. You see what happens in your own life when you actually move from reading a book about the Bible, like a devotional or somebody else's writings about the Bible, to actually reading the Bible. So we really want to emphasize that um, our priority is to be in God's word every day. And then anything else we do on top of that is superfluous and a blessing as well because there's great authors who've written wonderful things to help us uh, live and understand better. But we want to make sure we're actually in the Bible. That's the whole point of the study. All right. So the, this week's focus is the tr uh, true hope of all believers is in the coming return of Jesus as our ultimate deliverer. We must wait and we must wait well, growing in the grace and, no and knowledge of him during this time. So the way this study is laid out, here's an overview for you. Um, day one, that's today. Uh, we're going to read through all of Second Peter. And then day two, chapter one, and we're going to do that in two sessions. I'll do it in one for the recording, but you might on your own need to break it up into two. Day three uh, will be on chapter two. And day four, we'll wrap up the book on chapter three in two sessions also. There's only three chapters in in. Uh, Peter, Second Peter, it's one of the smallest books of the Bible. There are smaller ones, obviously, but this is one of the small ones. <laughs> All right, so day one, here we go. Read and take notes through Second Peter. I'm going to give you some prompts on doing that. We're going to read Second Peter and use the next pages to guide your reading. Write any notes and thoughts, questions, even drawings that will help you engage and understand Scripture. Now, before you read, and every day we do this, pray that God would open the eyes of your heart to see clearly the wonders of his word, that he would give you wisdom to grasp and apply what you're reading. So let's go ahead and do that before we begin the study. Let's pray. Father God, we come to your word once again today. We thank you for its power. We thank you that your word is alive. And unlike any other book, it can transform us from the inside out in a significant way. We hear and learn about who you are. And from that, we can understand better who we are and how better to live. We ask that you would go before us in our time of study right now and that you would bless us in our reading and um, that we would apply these words wisely into our life. We ask your hand of blessing now on our time in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's do this. So um, the active reading notes I've outlined here for you is a way to think through your scripture as you're reading. And... Um, what the idea is, is to kind of give you a guideline as you as you read. You can read and do it on your own and and, and um, think through it on your own. But this is just some, a couple quick ways to help you guide your reading a little bit. 
So um, we're going to read through all of the prompts before we read through Second Peter. So our mind is thinking ahead of these prompts and we can have them kind of rattling around before we begin. All right. So the first one is to whom is the letter written? And next is why is Peter writing the letter? Why is he writing this letter? Consider the big picture themes as well as his personal motivation. Uh, what does Peter write against throughout the letter? What other biblical authors, prophets, or people does Peter refer to generally or by name? Note any references to Jesus in this epistle. What can you learn about Peter's relationship with Christ from these passages? Write the references along with your observations. How would you summarize the message of this book in one or two sentences? Okay, let's do this. Keep those rattling around in your mind as we go. Get my water. Here we go. Simeon, Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ. Hold on just a quick second. Good morning. Glad everybody's here. <laughs> Let me start over. Simeon, Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have attained a faith of equal standing with ours by the righteousness of God and Savior Jesus Christ. So there's your answer to the first question. Who is he writing this letter to? To those who have obtained a faith of equal standing with ours by the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ. So fellow believers, okay? May grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and Jesus our Lord. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises, so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption of sinful desire. For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue, and virtue with knowledge, and knowledge with self-control, and self-control with steadfastness, and steadfastness with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he is blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election. For if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. For in this way, there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Therefore, I intend always to remind you of these qualities, though you know them and are established in the truth that you have. I think it right, as long as I am in the body, to stir you up by way of reminder, since I know that the putting off of my body will be soon, as our Lord Jesus Christ made clear to me. And I will make every effort so that after my departure, you may be able at any time to recall these things. For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father, and the voice was borne to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased, we ourselves heard this very voice born from heaven, for we were with him on the holy mountain. And we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed, to which you will do well to pay attention as to lamp shining in a dark place, until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy of scripture comes from someone's own interpretation, for no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along in the spirit. Chapter two, but false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who brought them, bringing upon themselves swift destruction. And many will follow their sensuality, and because of them, the way of truth will be blasphemed. And in their greed, they will exploit you with false words. Their condemnation from long ago is not idle, and their destruction is not asleep. 
For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into the into hell and committed them to chains of gloomy darkness and to be kept until the judgment, if he did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, a herald of righteousness with seven others, when he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly, if by turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to ashes, he condemned them to execution, making them an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly. And if he rescued righteous Lot, greatly distressed by the sensual conduct of the wicked, for as that righteous man lived among them day after day, he was tormenting his righteous soul over their lawless deeds that he saw and heard. Then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials and to keep the unrighteous under punishment until the day of judgment. And especially those who indulge in the lust of defiling passion and despise authority. Bold and willful, they do not tremble as they blaspheme the glorious ones, whereas angels, though greater in might and power, do not pronounce a blasphemous judgment against them before the Lord. But these, like irrational angels, creatures of instinct, born to be caught and destroyed, blaspheming about matters of which they are ignorant, will also be destroyed in their destruction. Suffering wrong as the wage for their wrongdoing, they count it a pleasure to revel in the daytime. They are blots and blemishes, reveling in their deceptions while they feast with you. They have eyes full of adultery, insatiable for sin. They entice unsteady souls. They have hearts trained in greed. Accursed children, forsaking the right way, they have gone astray. They have followed the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved gain from wrongdoing. But he was rebuked for his own transgression. A speechless donkey spoke with human voice and restrained the prophet's madness. These are waterless springs and mists driven by a storm. For them, the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved. For speaking loud boast of folly, they entice by sensual passions of the flesh those who are barely escaping from those who live in terror. They promise them freedom, but they themselves are slaves of corruption. For whatever overcomes a person, to that he is enslaved. For if, after they have escaped the defilements of the world through the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome, the last state has become worse for them than the first. For it would have been better for them never to have known the way of righteousness than, after knowing it, to turn back from the holy commandment delivered to them. What the true proverb says happened to them. The dog returns to its own vomit. And the sow, after washing herself, returns to wallow in the mire. Chapter 3, and a sip of my water. <laughs> this is now the second letter that I am writing to you, beloved. In both of them, I am stir stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder that you should remember the predictions of the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Savior through your apostles. Knowing this, first of all, that scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing, following their own sinful desires. They will say, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. For they deliberately overlook this fact, that the heavens existed long ago, and the earth was formed out of water and through water by the word of God, and that by means of these, the world that then existed was deluged with water and perished. But by the same word, the heavens and earth that now existed are stored up, uh, are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. But do not overlook this one fact, beloved that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief and then the heavens will pass away with a roar and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the day of the Lord, because of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn. But according to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells, 
Therefore, beloved, since you are waiting for these, be diligent to be found by him without spot or blemish and at peace. And count the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you according to the wisdom given him, as he does in all his letters when he speaks in them of these matters. There are some things in them that are hard to understand, which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction, as they do the other scriptures. You, therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, take care that you are not carried away by the error of lawless people and lose your own stability, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus, uh, Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. That's the end of Second Peter. And let's go back through and talk about some of the, the questions that I've written out for you to consider. So this first uh, letter we kind of answered as we began, who is this letter written? Uh, to whom is the letter written? Uh, well, it's the same network of churches um, in First Peter, those exiles that were in Asia Minor, to those he writes who have obtained a faith of equal standing. Number two, why is Peter writing this letter? Consider the big picture themes as well as his personal motivation. Well, he wants us to be armed against bad teaching. Um, let's take a look at chapter one. I have a little typo there. I'll fix that later. Um, chapter one, verse 12 here. Therefore, I intend always to remind you of these qualities, though you know them and are established in the truth that you have. Um, through, oh, through 15. I think it is right as long as I'm in the body to stir you up by way of reminder, since I know that the putting off of my body will be soon, as our Lord Jesus Christ made clear to me, and I will make every effort so that after my departure, you may be able at any time to recall these things. He wants us to be armed against bad teaching. Have you, have you felt that throughout his letter? He's acknowledging that there's some bad teaching going on. People are denying the truth, and people are twisting um, the truth of Paul. And so he wants to be, us to be armed. Um, he wants to, us to be faithful and assured of our hope. Um, he knows he's dying soon. You have a sense of this being his final letter and that he realizes this is his last letter, that he's going to be dying soon. In chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, this is now the second letter that I am writing you, beloved. In both of them, I'm stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder that you should remember the predictions of the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Savior through your apostles. So he's stirring up. He wants us to remember the prophets. This is back in the Old Testament and even John the Baptist um, and the predictions of the prophets, but also the commandments of the Lord. So he wants us to be recalling that. And so he's going to write it out in his way to help us to do that. All right. Number three, what does Peter write against throughout this letter? Well, there's a lot of things that he writes against. Um, and there's specifically three different things you might have noticed as you we were reading. Let's take a look back at chapter one, verses 16 through 20. Um, verse 16 through 20. Here we go. For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when we received honor and glory from, the, from God the Father and the voice was born to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased, we ourselves heard this very voice born from heaven, for we were with him on the holy mountain. Um, Sorry, I got <laughs> my eyeballs wandered there. And we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed, to which you will do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns, the morning star rises in your hearts, knowing this first of all, that no prophecy of scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. So he's trying to make sure people realize this isn't us making up stuff. This isn't us making up cleverly devised myths. We were eyewitnesses. That's the first one. Let's take a look at chapter 2, um, verses 1 through 3. Again, another thing that he's writing against here. But false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will be false prophets among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master, Jesus, who bought them, bringing upon themselves swift destruction. And many will follow their sensuality, and because of them, the way of truth will be blasphemed. And in their greed, they will exploit you with false words. Their condemnation from long ago is not idle, and their destruction is not asleep. So there, there are people that are denying that there's going to be, that there isn't going to be some kind of a final reckoning. 
and he's here to say not so <laughs> there's definitely going to be a final reckoning so make sure you are on the side of righteousness and then in chapter 3 verses 1 through 4 this is now the second letter that I am writing you, beloved. In both of them, I am stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder that you should remember the predictions of the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Savior through your apostles, knowing this, first of all, that scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing, following their own sinful desires. They will say, here's what he's writing against. This is what they say. They will say, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of the creation. Everything just going along. He's not coming back. All right. And he's saying, those are the fools who are going to be saying that. Uh, Peter didn't even realize how long it would be until Christ's coming. So we might even have people today who are saying the same thing. So what is he writing against? He's writing against people who are questioning why it appears that Christ is taking so long to return. All right. So throughout the book... He, Peter refers to other biblical authors, prophets, Peter, um, uh, people that he refers to. Did you hear any uh, people from your Old Testament studies? Of course, in general, false prophets have come. He refers to that in chapter 2. Um, in chapter 2, verse 4, a very interesting. Um, this is your, for those of you who are interested in studying angelology, the, the study of angels in the Bible. For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to chains of gloomy darkness to be kept until the judgment. So he's talking about angels here and the fascinating occurrence there that they were judged. They sinned, so angels can sin. Um, uh, Noah and the flood, he's that was mentioned. Of course, Sodom and Gomorrah and Lot. And he really makes a very clear case that Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed because of their immorality and sensuality. And and then Lot was set aside as, as a righteous man and was spared. And then we have this fascinating story about Balaam and Balaam's donkey. And if you're unfamiliar with that story in the Bible, go back and read that in Numbers chapter 22, I think. And a fascinating story. We'll get into that a little bit later um, as we continue our Bible study through this book. All right. So note any references to Jesus in this epistle. What can you learn about Peter's relationship with Christ from these passages? What are right references along with your observations? Um, well, I think the most beautiful um, remembrance here is in chapter one where he writes, um, since I know, verse 14, since I know that the putting off of my body will be soon, as our Lord Jesus Christ made clear to me. If you were with us in our study through Luke, or if you just happen to remember that from your own studies, uh, we studied that passage when um, God, when Christ tells Peter that he's, you know, his time is going to come. And so um, that's also spoken of in John, and we'll dig into that a little bit later. But Peter has a, a very close and personal relationship with Christ, and he references the transfiguration. He references um, Jesus telling him that he will die and um, that it won't be the way he wants to. So it's a good reference and a good to see the heart of Peter, that he loves his Savior so much. So how would you summarize the message of this book in one or two sentences? thinking through what we've read, write down some thoughts there. I wrote here, God will keep his promises, so we must be faithful to his true teachings. Be on guard against falsehood and live holy lives while we wait. All right. So we'll be back here, our next study tomorrow. Um, we'll, we'll break out chapter one. We'll do a chapter a day for the next three days. And thank you for being here with me on this. Appreciate you checking in and saying hi. It's always nice to, to know people are listening along. Every now and then I hear the study uh, someone gives me feedback I listen to your Bible study and I never saw or anything so it's fun it's fun for me to know that somebody's out there is listening and connecting um, that we're not just I'm not just talking out into a void <laughs> that people are actually out there listening so thank you for that let me know that you're out there that encourages me as well so go ahead and and uh, share this um, introduction to second Peter encourage your friends to join us and why not? Why not get everybody that you know excited about getting into the Word and studying it together? So God bless you. Have a great rest of your day. Um, I'll be back here tomorrow, and uh, we'll have another good day of study. Bye-bye for now.